Welcome back to another episode of the Junior Future Podcast. I'm your host, Luis Duque. Today, I have Sophie Warrior with me. She is an amazing woman in engineering, doing a lot of work for other women in engineering and empowering them to succeed in their careers. How are you doing today? And just give us a quick background on what you do with your company, what you do as an engineer, and all the things you're, you've been doing. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I can give you a bit of a backstory on how I kind of got into what I'm doing now. I started my career as a structural engineer and worked as a consultant in high-rise buildings, mostly in concrete and residential for about uh, eight years. And in that experience, I often found it difficult to connect with other women as mentors or as peers for looking for support and kind of my own professional development. And so in that, I decided to launch and then ultimately chair the employee resource groups at the companies I was working at, which was a great experience in terms of looking at policies to help retain and recruit more women at the companies that I was working at. But wanting to take that a little bit further, about four years ago, I was hearing that a lot of other women I knew in my network were struggling with the same things, and maybe they were even at smaller firms, so there's even less women there. So I then uh, co-founded and then co-chaired for three years a nonprofit called Women in Consulting Engineering Vancouver, which is a group um, based in Vancouver, Canada, where I'm located, that helps build community for women in the engineering industry. And so... I, kind of, I think that was really the spark for my passion for gender equity work. And then when I passed on the torch to the first new round of directors, I was A, recognizing that, you know, there's lots of other industries that are male dominated as well beyond engineering too, and other, other aspects of STEM too. And then also just wanting to continue that work. So then last year, I co-founded the Thoughtful Co with uh, my partner, Jillian Clemmy, who that led us to kind of expand that service offering so that we could advise employers on policies to retain more women and improve gender equity in their workplaces. And then another piece bringing in her background was coaching women on compensation negotiations so they could help um, negotiate for the compensation that they that they deserve. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm kind of curious, we can start a conversation kind of where, where that journey began because Obviously, we heard engineers are shy, introverted. They're not really business people. But obviously, starting a company and starting something that is related to engineering, but not so much in terms of like the technical stuff. I want to hear kind of how the journey began and how was kind of those first few months of, of just starting your company and maybe even working for yourself. Yeah, it's been such a strange experience in so many ways. It's so exciting, but it's mm -hmm. also so different in so many ways from engineering. I have this kind of like internal struggle, I think, because I've spent so much of my career as an engineer fighting to keep women in engineering. And now I'm a woman leaving engineering, but I'm trying to justify that to myself because at least I'm working to keep other women in the profession. But I think navigating those kind of flows of entrepreneurship was very different for me because as a person whose baseline is kind of risk averse, um, having that uncertainty, but at the same time, I think the overall benefit is having more ownership of my own time and the creative creativity to explore my own priorities versus someone else's priorities for me for what needs to get done. So I think that's been really cool, but I think at like a basic level, I was always so passionate about helping other people and then specifically women. So that reward has been so great. Yeah. What, what were some of those first like hints of, okay, I'm working as an engineer. I'm seeing other women struggling, advancing their careers, maybe negotiating salaries. What were some of those first hints that you saw when you were as an engineer, maybe from your own personal experience that led you to take this move and, and start these, these two companies? Yeah, I think that's such a good question. I found to be honest, like, and I, I'm sure a piece of this is privilege, being like a white woman in an urban environment. When I was in school, to be honest, I didn't really see a lot of gender equity. Like I think I was a little bit blind to it and I was also in a little school bubble. And, you know, a lot of my assignments, my exams were, you know, engineering is very, in at least academically, very black and white. So there's right answers and wrong answers. So I didn't see a lot of bias. And 
So when I was in school, I didn't really connect as much with women in engineering groups, for example. And then it wasn't until I started my career where I was starting to realize, you know, in a consulting environment, I had my male peers at my company. It was so much easier for them to network with other people in industry. And it was a little bit more socially awkward for me to do that. And there was just all these little almost like hidden challenges and barriers that I found, or even just have that having that, I, people talk about imposter syndrome a lot when you're, you look different from the people around you. I think it was more difficult for me to negotiate my salary or share an opinion. I never felt as confident as I remembered feeling when I was at school. So I think I had this, you know, I knew my stuff, but I didn't feel it as confident saying that. And I think that was where it all stemmed from when I started to notice like, oh, this is quite a different experience for me when I don't look like the people around me. And I'm sure that gets even more exaggerated for women of color, or LGBTQ women as well. And the more different you feel from the like majority. Yeah, that's, it's, it's definitely something that's kind of hard to see when you're in it. And maybe you don't take take that step back and actually analyze kind of what are the people that in this room, what do they look like, how they're acting, what are their views? And a lot of people get caught in that situation after maybe something has happened. Uh, but it's kind of good to hear that again, you're starting to see those hints, you're starting to see that there was there was a need for this, and then you work towards that solution. What are some of the things that you see women struggle the most? right after they graduate from college and maybe what are some of the ways they can do or what, what can they do to really overcome those challenges and like present themselves as, as just important members of society? Yeah, I think that's such a good question. And I think there's lots of different ways to build that, but I, I think the two main ones that jump out at me are, are finding a sense of community and then mm -hmm. finding mentorship. And I guess to start with mentorship, it doesn't mean that you can't have mentors who are different genders. I have great male mentors that are, have, have had advice that's been so impactful to my career. But I think it was always really valuable to also have women mentors, whether or not they're even in my exact field or discipline. It was helpful to have someone who maybe had experienced some of those barriers and had creative ways to address them or things to look out for that maybe I wasn't noticing right when I was graduating. So I think finding mentorship is really important. And if you're not able to do that at your own company, maybe you're a small company and you are one of the only women, I think trying to find external communities. And I think there's so many different nonprofits or community organizations for women in engineering or women in STEM, like whether it's at an academic level or early career. And just finding the ones that work for you. And I think that also a, gives you the opportunity to connect with mentors, but it also builds that sense of community. So maybe if you're one of few or the only woman at a company, you can meet other women in your industry in these external groups as well. And I think that starts to fuel that sense of like, okay, I do belong here and maybe I do look different in my company, but I don't look as different on the industry as a whole. And I also get tips and support from those people as well. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I know on social media at least, there's a lot of women in engineering doing amazing things. And it's it's fun to, every time I bring women in engineering and we talk about these things, I realize how closely connected we really all are through social media, through doing, sharing our experiences and everything. But that's a great way to really connect with others. I know as a Hispanic coming to US to study engineering, I, I got that sense of like, I don't belong here. Like these are some new experiences. These are some new things happening around me. But having that community on social media, I've been able to meet amazing people. This episode number ninety three or ninety four of the podcast, so many interviews, so many new experiences. That it's great to find those experiences outside, find those mentors outside, maybe your inner circle, and just widen that perspective with other engineers that are doing maybe different things. They have different views. They have different perspectives, different career goals, different things going on in their lives. So it's always great to kind of widen that mindset of even even if I'm in a small town in the middle of Nebraska or South Dakota or in the middle of nowhere, 
the people around me may look different, but when I look out and I look at social media, there's a lot of people doing similar things that I'm doing, passionate about helping others. And I think that's where we just need to open our minds to those new experiences and having new mentors and new new people around us. Yeah, I think that's so true. Like the more the more exposure you get to different types of people and all types of experiences, you get more open-minded as well. I think to some extent, that's maybe why I didn't connect with, say, gender equity or, or, or see inequity when I was mm-hmm. at school, because I think my world was really small. I just grown up in the same city, known a lot of the same friends and went to the uni- university for this first time with lots of people that were similar. And then every kind of new person you meet, whether it's their socioeconomic background, their race, their gender, their religion, etc., you start to like build more and become more open-minded. And I think all of those new experiences help to build that because diversity looks so different. And I think we talk a lot about diversity with respect to race and gender and maybe sexual orientation, but there's so many types of diversity that makes someone's perspective so different from yours. Yeah. And and I think that's, that's a great point as well, just to understand that, your experience is not really the norm. Could be positive or negative, it's not really the norm. There is always another side to that coin. So even if my experience is great, I didn't really face any big obstacles when I was going to school, doesn't mean that someone else on the other side of the country has the same experience and and vice versa. They had a terrible experience going through college. They were bullied, they were all of these things. That's not the norm. It doesn't mean that it's right, but that's usually not the norm. and, And we have to, again, create that experience and look wider than our just inner circle where we are right now. I want to ask you kind of the the million dollar question, which is how can we keep more women in STEM? And like, why why are why do we hear so much that people are or women are especially are living STEM in in great numbers? Yeah, I think that's such a good question because when I look at least at Canadian data academically, engineering, although we're not at fifty percent yet the academic ratios have increased a lot over the last like 10 to 20 years and we're approaching on an average around 35 percent but the number of licensed professional engineers over the last 20 years has really just hovered around that 13 percent mark and i know of women that do leave the profession 60 percent of those women do so in the first five years so there really seems to be that leaky pipeline where people are starting and entering, but just not staying. And so in my opinion, and I know this is a, like, uh, it can be a polarizing concept, but I don't think we can really make a big move without some form of affirmative action. And, and I mean that like at a, at individual company levels, but sort of working together as an industry as well. And it doesn't need to be as extreme as setting quotas for hiring a specific number of women or promoting a specific number of women, it can be just being reflective of barriers and saying, we're going to interview a minimum number of women, or we're going to not close this job posting until we get a certain percent or a certain number of women's uh, resumes on our desk, or we're going to put the names forward of a minimum number of women when we do our annual performance reviews and look who's getting promotions. And I think those types of things can really help push the needle because I think keeping those senior women in the industry who are maybe in their kind of been in the industry for 10 plus years, I think will also help keep the women in the one to five year because they'll have more mentorship and they'll see more people like them in senior levels. And it's easier to, I think, see yourself in those roles when you see someone who looks like you in some way. But I know affirmative action in some ways can be difficult for people to digest, but I just don't think it needs to be as extreme as we're hiring this many women. Yeah, and I heard something from other women that I interview here is just the rate that women apply to jobs and like when they look at the minimal requirements and they don't see every single bullet point applying to them, they say, this job is not for me, I'm not X, Y, and Z. But when you look at men, they see that minimum requirement and they may only find that one skill applies to them, they're more likely to apply. Why do you think there is such a difference in in that mentality of women applying to jobs and, and men applying to jobs 
knowing that it's just a little guideline that the company has in terms of like, this is more or less who I want to hire and how maybe having mentors, maybe having a different perspective when they were growing up in their careers may shift that mindset from maybe this job and hundred percent fit for it instead of, okay, I'm 60% fit for this job. I'm just going to apply and see what happens. Yeah, I think that's such a great case, like questions. It does come, I think, so much from socialization. And I feel like I lived a very micro study version of that experience when I was applying to jobs when I was graduating because my partner, who's a man, is, was in the same industry and we were applying to similar jobs. And I had all this confidence in school. I think my grades were higher than his. and But I was very much a person who was not applying to things if I didn't have all of the points and he was applying to everything. And he, I mean, he obviously also had great grades as well, but was more confident to just try. And I also, I think a note, I think what I noticed as well is having more confidence to do those terribly uncomfortable LinkedIn reach outs to people or ask someone, do do you know someone at this company? Can you get me in front of someone? Whereas I had this experience and I think a lot of women have it as well, of almost more waiting to be selected. If I do well, someone will find me and give me this job or give me this promotion versus saying, I need this job and I deserve this job or I need this promotion, I deserve this promotion. And I was, it took me a few years of working to kind of get over that and notice how different it was. And I think some of it must come from looking different than the people around you and feeling a little bit more of that, thanks for having me versus I deserve to be here, if you look dissimilar than the people around you. So I don't know what the perfect answer is to fix it, but at the same time, I would just say, just try it and do the uncomfortable and just apply and reach out to all those people on LinkedIn because that is so much now how we get jobs and build connections. But I think so many people struggle from, you know, I do well and someone will find me and I'll just apply to the one that has all the boxes because I'll get that job versus, you know, I have 60% of the things, but maybe I make up for them and things they haven't listed. Yeah. And and I think the last point is, is exactly right. I think, when, when I was applying for jobs, again, you see those minimal requirements. And it, again, they're just minimal requirements. They, they doesn't mean like, if you don't have all of them, you're not going to get accepted into the job. And again, phrasing, when you apply to the job and maybe you get an interview saying, okay, these are the things that I'm great at. These are the things maybe I'm not that great at. And I think that in itself is a great skill to have just knowing what you don't know and seeing how you can fill that gap with the skills that you do know. So again, it's it's kind of it's it's a complicated scenario. There's a lot of things that are just behind the fact that some people are more likely to apply quickly to that job, and others are just feeling like they need to be 100% fit for that job. I'm I'm kind of curious going back to your engineering career. You said you were a structural engineer. You practiced for some time, and then moved to what you're doing now. Uh, do you want to just give us a quick overview of like what you did, what did you do as an engineer, and ultimately? How was that transition to to your new companies? Yeah, so I worked in consulting in buildings and typically in residential buildings. And I think, yeah, I, I enjoyed it so much. And I'm still sort of have my foot in the door and I'm still working part time in that industry as well. So I haven't left it entirely. Mm-hmm. And I think what I liked so much about it, when I was going into engineering, I had this perception I'm very interested in this, but at the same time, I had this fear that I was going to be working alone at a desk and that it wasn't social and it wasn't creative. And I found, at least in what I did, is it was so much more creative and so much more collaborative than I'd initially expected. And I think the favorite parts of my job as a structural engineer were always whenever someone would bring something forward that was really difficult or initially seemingly impossible and trying to find a creative way to make it work or make something that might look similar work. And you get to kind of go back to the basics of problem solving, which I think is why so many engineers like what they do. It's like that almost high when you figure out something that you didn't think or you like 
wake up in the middle of the night and you have that idea like, oh, I think I know how to make that work now. And so, yeah, I felt very torn. I found a really difficult decision to move into this new line of work because so much of what I was doing, I liked so much and I liked, I wanted to keep more women in the industry not leaving. But in so many ways, I just felt kind of pulled more and more to that um, working directly with an individual and helping them feel good in their role and, you know, negotiate for that compensation that they were striving for or helping an employer retain more women um, in the industry. And so it was definitely a big decision to make. But I also think there's so much overlap in what I've ended up doing, again, because I tend to work with a lot of uh, women in STEM or in companies working in STEM as well and being able to support them in ways and very um, using my kind of analytical mind and problem solving because I'm a big, I'm very passionate about when we talk about improving gender equity, setting specific targets and measuring the success of different policies with intentional metrics. So not just generally making things better, but really measuring that success. And I think a lot of that comes from my engineering mind. Yeah. And I think that's, again, like we were just saying, engineering is such a complex field that really gets our wheels turning as you start seeing problems, you really want to solve those problems. And obviously, leaving engineering to solve a different kind of problem is just as important as staying in engineering and solving just technical problems. Because at the end of the day, I think you were pursuing that dream that you really wanted to have of helping women in engineering. And I'm sure if you had stayed in engineering, you could have, have something on the side and, and help maybe a few handful of women. But by starting this, you're really helping and making an impact on maybe hundreds of women, maybe thousands of women at one time. So again, it's it's a it's a complicated scenario where you're trying to keep women in engineering, but you're leaving engineering to keep women in engineering. So it's it's kind of a a funny scenario there. Let, now let, let's talk about a little bit about your company, the Thoughtful Call, and maybe give us a little insight into the name and what you do with, with women in, in this company. Yeah, so the Thoughtful Co., the name itself came from both my partner and I are backgrounds of really sometimes in the corporate war, world being a little bit rushed and not being able to spend as much time on things up front as we wanted to and having to get things out the door to a you know appropriate level, but having to go back and adjust them a little bit later. And so the name Thoughtful came from really being able to do saying things intentionally and thoughtfully the first time very thoroughly. And uh, what we do, our mission is to improve gender equity in the workplace. And we do that with two main service offerings. So we work for one, with individual clients, we would work with a woman who's maybe got uh, an interview coming up or has a job offer on the table or is preparing for an upcoming performance review. And we would do either one-on-one -on -one prep sessions to coach in defining what that number ask should be, whether it's you know base salary or an equity component or a bonus component, but also doing contractual review as well. So we would review their contract and make recommendations on different areas to push and what might be you know normal for a particular industry or how we would frame that ask for that individual um, so that someone can go in really confidently on how to negotiate for that compensation that they deserve and feeling really good about the number that they select and how to frame it around their particular skill set relative to that role and then the other piece we do is we advise employers on policies for retain, retaining women. And so we'll do things like helping them implement or maintain an employee resource group and get really the most about, out of that group. So whether that's an aspect of building community, but also looking at policies. And then we'd help them select a few key policies to focus on for a year or for two or five years so that they're not kind of diluting their efforts, trying to do lots of things at the same time. We can really get a lot of impact from a couple key initiatives, which I think also is really impactful, particularly for any consulting firms or just any busy industry, 
it's always a challenge. Resources are limited. So you really want to get a lot of bang for your buck on what you do choose to go forward with. Yeah, that's great. And I'm, I'm sure when you started this and things started to click and see, okay, there's actually a lot more people than I thought that needed this kind of help. I think things start to roll and, and things start to feel great. And you probably thought, okay, this is a great decision here. All the women are impacting and, and I'm sure you probably felt amazing working the women, maybe even more than just practicing engineering. Yeah, exactly. It was always so nice. Like, especially, you know, I got an email from a client this morning who just got the raise that they initially didn't think that they were going to be able to push quite to that level for and hearing her excitement in, I mean, already being really excited, excited to go into that role and now having a number that they're feeling really good at, really good about was very exciting. And I think that positive feedback is just so nice to have that impact on someone really feeling good about a role they're going into or helping a company build that really engaging environment and to retain more people, I think is really positive. Yeah, that, that's that's great. I'm sure, again, it feels amazing just to have that special connection with so many women that are maybe struggling in their careers and looking for something new and, and are really uh, changing their careers for, for life. Um, as, as we wrap up this conversation, uh, do you have any other pieces of advice, uh, suggestions, things that you want to share with, with the listeners? Yeah, I think, I think two key things that I would you know, maybe say to myself when I was starting my career or anytime I'm making a move in the past is just having that confidence to go for it and to be reflective of what your needs are and being able to communicate them. So, and then I think that really stems also into when you're negotiating for things that you need in a new role. And again, whether that's scope of role or the title that you're asking for, or, you know, that number that you're asking for, really remembering that you deserve that and that it's so normal to ask for those things. And that's just part of your, you know, because we give so much to our companies and, and being able to feel really good about that number. And I think it's easy to get caught up in, if you look in any way different from the people around you, just, you know, saying, okay, I'll take that. That sounds good. But even just building that list of strengths that you have or big wins that you've had, I think builds so much of your confidence of like, okay, I know I do really deserve this. And I have, I am, you know, contributing, contributing a lot of meaningful things. I think that's really important to remember because it is easy to just kind of go in day to day and get your projects done and not notice how impactful some of the things you're doing are. Absolutely. Yeah. I t totally agree with all of that. Um, I have one last question for you and that's how can we continue engineering our future? I think continuing to be, open-minded and creative. And I think, I mean, part of that stems from diversity. Different people will have different experiences and bring new ideas. And I think more and more just challenging the norm. It doesn't mean reinventing the wheel in every single new problem, but just being open-minded the way we've done things before doesn't need to be the way we do them in the future. If there's a way to do things faster, more sustainably, or, you know, with a reduced footprint, I think always thinking about that going into new problems, is there a better way I can do this? Can I you know, be a better engineer tomorrow? And being open-minded when people bring up ideas that may seem outlandish or different, give them a chance, and maybe it is a great idea moving forward. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And again, Sophie, thank you so much for coming to the show, for sharing all the wisdom, for helping so many women engineering. Uh, where can people connect with you and, and continue the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. You can find us on our website at thethoughtfulco.net or follow us on Instagram at thethoughtful.co. And then we're also on LinkedIn, LinkedIn as well at thethoughtfulco. Love to stay in touch. Wonderful. Thank you for coming to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. If you really enjoyed this episode of the Engineering Future Podcast, you're going to love the content we have over our website at luisfelipeduque.com. You can find the link in the description of this episode as well as the show notes at luisfelipeduque.com slash podcast. Every episode comes packed with a lot of links, a lot of information. So you can find all the show notes and all the information related to this episode over at luisfelipeduque.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for coming back to this episode. Thank you, Jack Windows, for the music. And as always, let's continue engineering our future.